Welcome to Church of the Redeemer, whether you're here in person or on Zoom today. I apologize for the short delay that was happening today that uh, was due to inconveniences that we were not ready to handle, but now we are here and ready to continue. My name is Haltor and I'm the pastor here at this Church of the Redeemer, where we strive to welcome all and we hope your experience in worship today will be meaningful, challenging, and joyful. We are transitioning to using pew pads again. Please use them to sign your name so we know that you came and worshiped with us today. I'm glad to be able to be in worship with you today. Sianel is our music director, Vicky Ratliff is our liturgist, and Sam is responsible for our tech. Please join Vicky in a call to worship. People of God, open your eyes, look around. The presence of our Lord Jesus Christ is here, among us and within us. God's salvation is close at hand, nearer than you know. So open your hearts and minds to the Spirit, and let's worship God together. God among us, we gather in the name of your Son to learn love for one another. Turn our feet from evil paths, our hands from shameful deeds, our minds to your wisdom, and our hearts to your grace. Amen. Amen. And the opening hymn is Lead On, O Cloud of Presence, from the faith we sing, the small hymnal, number 2234. Let's hear the words of assurance. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and God's compassion is over all God's creation. The Lord is faithful in all their words, and gracious in all their deeds. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. Hear the word of the Lord in Jesus. Your sins are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. 
And now let's hear the epistle. The epistle reading this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter 13, although the bulletin may say 14. It's chapter 13, verses 8 through 14, from the NRSV Bible. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law, the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, and therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now, how it is now, I am sorry people, for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in reveling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And the hymn of preparation, the gift of love, is from the United Methodist Hymnal number 408. And the gospel lesson today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 20, verses 15 through 20, from the NRSV. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offend offender refuses to listen even to the church, 
let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. When I read the Gospel text earlier this week, my first thought was, this can't be right. Jesus couldn't have said this. I looked at different English translations, checked out various other languages, and even did some diving into the original Greek text. And to be honest, I got so stuck in semantics and word use for nearly three days, I was unable to address the content of today's text. Because I think I can say for a fact that Jesus would never have used the Greek word ecclesia in a sentence. Ecclesia is the word that is translated in the NRSV version as the word church. And the word church is used three times in today's NRSV translation of the gospel. So I spent way too much time thinking about Matthew's use of the words and way too little time addressing what the text tries to teach. But allow me to pray. Guide my words, O oh God. Open our hearts and minds to your presence. Amen. When I finally sat down yesterday to write the sermon today, I felt I had left the translation word study behind. I was over that. And when I had just found the right rhythm to write about Jesus' warning about triangulations in communications, according to family systems theory, I got distracted after about three minutes by a Facebook message from a friend in Iceland asking, and this does not happen every week, this does not happen every month, but as I was writing this sermon, I got this question, why there had been a change in Bible translations, both in English and Icelandic, in the book of Deuteronomy, concerning gifts or bribes to judges. And I'm not going to ad address the, my answer here, but it seems like the Bible has something directly to say about the supreme justice controversy in this country. I got sidetracked for about 20 minutes because I have this squirrel mentality that if I get a question, I have to ask, answer it looking at various translations, learning about when the English word bribe was first used in print to mean what we think bribe means. And I looked for the origins of the same, for the Icelandic words that has the same meaning. Uh, and I started to think Bible translations apparently matter. What words are used can influence what we understand to be true, and how we understand right and wrong. And after responding to my friend with explanations for possible reasons for the translation changes for the Hebrew word shohar between Bible translations from 16th and 21st century, I was again stuck thinking about the word ecclesia or church, a word I know or knew Jesus didn't use, even though Matthew quotes him twice using it, and the translators of NRSV use it at least four times in their translation of Matthew. And you might ask, does it really matter that Matthew is perhaps misquoting Jesus, or probably more correctly, mistranslating or over-translating what Jesus said in Arama Aramaic when Matthew writes the gospel in Greek. And I think it does, 
even though it might not be the most important part of this text. And just sharing with you that over-translating means when the translator or the writer adds something to the translation to make the understanding of the text more narrow or more specific. And I was kind of stuck thinking that is what we see here. First with Matthew using the word ecclesia for something that Jesus, when Jesus would never have used it. And then again, the NRSV using the word church three times in the translation of this text, when in fact, I wanna say Jesus never used it. So what does Matthew's over translation tell us about the first Christians? Well, in the year 85, Matthew was finishing his gospel. Maybe 90, we are not fully sure. It doesn't have a date, but 85 seems like a good guess of a date when it was written. And he was finishing his gospel, reflecting on Jesus' teaching and looking at the new church. This assembly of people calling them Christ followers. Jesus, uh, Matthew was gathering stories, saying, and sermons attributed to Jesus, many from first-person testimonies. And Matthew comes across this fragment of a conversation regarding love, respect, and conflict. And Matthew starts to write it up, trying to stay honest to Jesus' teaching, but being greatly influenced by the messed up church community that he now belonged to. Matthew had already put the word ecclesia into Jesus' mouth once when Matthew had shared that Peter was going to be the leader of the group after Jesus' ascension. Peter would be the rock the church was built on. And again, Jesus probably didn't say church, but and now again, as Matthew reflects on Jesus' it's teaching about conflict, Matthew sees it as a teaching about the church. This community of Christ followers dealing with endless conflicts about all kinds of things. So he over-translates today's gospel and uses the word ecclesia again to explain that Jesus' teaching about conflict is meant to teach us about church conflicts. An over-translation that continues in the English NRSV translation, where the English translators, in an attempt to help Matthew focus that this is about the church, use the word few extra times, even as other translations would have been way more obvious. Because some of the times they use the translation church, they're actually translating the word siblings. So, but they are so focused, this must be about the church, that they are willing to mistranslate or over-translate. So both Matthew translating Aramaic oral testimony to Greek, and later NRSV translators translating from Greek to English, over-translate to make Jesus' teaching about conflict resolution as something that first and foremost applies to church conflict alone. We cannot be fully sure what Jesus meant. Maybe he was speaking in narrow terms like the translators and Matthew indicate. Maybe he was being prophetic about church conflict even before the church existed. And that would not have been a very difficult thing to be prophetic about. But I have a feeling that Matthew's experience with churches influenced how he interpreted the text that became today's gospel text. Matthew knew that the first church wasn't the friendly place all the time where all shared everything and people were happy all the time. That was not the church then, and it's not always the church now. Matthew had experience with church conflict and saw what Jesus said about conflict in that light and added the Greek word ecclesia into Jesus' speech. 
However, so now you see really what I'm thinking about when I'm preaching and, and preparing preaching. I'm thinking about things like that. But however, whether this text is generally text about conflict or singularly focused on church conflict, Matthew's and perhaps Jesus's response or resolve to conflict is important. If we are, according to the text, and here is a part of it that I think comes from Jesus, not Matthew. If we are unable to resolve the conflict, we should treat those that disagree with us like a Gentile and a tax collector. That is the important thing to take from the text. That is an important learning for all of us. When we disagree with someone, we should treat them like a Gentile and a tax collector. Which brings us to the question, <laughs> what did Jesus teach about how we should treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Yes, exactly. We should go to their homes and eat and drink with them. We should listen to them and party with them. We should heal their family members. We should celebrate their lives and learn from them, those that we disagree with. That is at least what Jesus did with tax collectors and Gentiles, again and again and again. And Jesus' reminder, or Matthew's, that whatever we bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever we lose on earth will be loosed in heaven, is not promising us some great power over others, but a warning. A warning that we should be careful in our judgment of others, because our judgment, or binding, and our need to limit others will affect God's reign will hurt God's kingdom. God that we believe in is not in the business of binding but liberating. And we should too. And perhaps the words, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, can be seen as the ultimate joke by Matthew. Living in a church where it is full of conflict, you can see these words as almost a dark, cynical take on church conflict. The church will never, ever agree on anything. So this is a moot point. All of us will never, ever agree on anything. However, even though we don't agree in the midst of the conflict and whenever we gather, Jesus promises, I am among you. I might have spent too much of my academic studies looking at church conflicts. My understanding that even the first church, even the people sponsoring the writing of the Gospels, feeding the Gospel writers, were inundated with conflict, might affect my perhaps cynical take on some of today's Gospel. I might have spent too much time this week wondering why Matthew puts the word Ecclesia into Jesus' mouth. However, the message in today's gospel is st pretty straightforward. If you have unsolvable conflict with people, whether inside or outside the church, please treat them the same way Jesus treated Gentiles and tax collectors. Go out and eat and drink with them. Listen to them and party with them. Help heal their family members, celebrate their lives, and learn from them. It might not always work out as we plan. Sometimes we will fail being Jesus-like. But whether we manage to do those things or not, we can trust that in the midst of all our conflicts and all our gatherings, Jesus promises, I am among you. Amen. The prayer hymn is Come My Way, My Truth, My Life. In the United Methodist Hymnal 164, we sing verse 2. <laughs>
Let's pray. God, you call us to love and serve you. By loving and serving our brothers and sisters, our siblings near and far. To put their needs and interests ahead of our own. And so to fulfill your love of love. And so we offer our prayers for the world you created. In your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who do not have what they need in order to survive. Those without enough food and water, medical care, shelter, or security. Open our hearts to see the needs in our world and to respond with your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are living with serious illness or injury, who face each day with uncertainty or pain, who find themselves wondering what the future holds. Open our hearts to see the needs of those around us and to respond with your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We also pray for your church, the body of Christ on earth. We pray that we would be a living example of your love in our world, treating one another with compassion and respect, settling differences with love and integrity, bound together by our common allegiance to you. Open our hearts to see one another and to respond with your love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you, O God, for the way of love modeled for us by Jesus Christ. Open our hearts and lives to your ongoing presence among us so that we would grow in faithfulness and love and bring honor to your name. Hear us, O God, as we pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. And as we reflect on our giving to the world and to this church, let's hear the offertory.
Let's pray the prayer of dedication. God, we bring to you our gifts, our talents, and our treasures. Help us to use them wisely so our work may reflect glimpses of your kingdom. Amen. The closing hymn is They Will Know We Are Christians by Our Love in the smaller hymnal 2223. receive God's benediction. Now go forth from this place with renewed inspiration to do the work of God. Seek good, not evil, love goodness and establish justice. This is the greatest offering we can make, letting justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Go in peace with love for our neighbors. Amen. Amen.